All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space. I think we are live. Uh, I'm your host, Carter Laren, and I'm joined, as, as almost always, by Carrie Smith. Carrie, say hello. Hi, Carter. Uh, we are, Carrie and I are both super excited today because we have a chance to talk to someone who um, I think we've both been following for a while and who has made an even bigger name for himself in the past few years. Um, Mike Cernovich. Mike is a leading independent journalist, filmmaker, and author. His documentary on fake news called Hoaxed is currently, I think, the number one selling independent film on iTunes. Mike's controversial reporting has helped lead to the resignation of congressman, the arrest of convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Um, his first book, Gorilla Mindset, sold over 100,000 copies. Uh, he's one of the most lied about people in the public eye, I think. Um, you can follow him on Twitter at Cernovich, or you can go to Cernovich.com or HoaxedMovie.com to learn more information. Mike, thank you so much for joining today. Yeah, my pleasure. And we were number two uh, on Indie. Adam Sandler's film Uncut Gems, which had, which had a budget of $20 million, um, you know, is still a little bit selling a little bit better than Hoax, but had, but had a budget of 290000 but we're, um, we're like absolutely thrilled, to, to put it mildly about yeah. how well Hoax is doing. Yeah, well, uh, in a week when they play this, maybe that will be true. Uh, right. You'll have you'll have unseated him. <laughs> so close enough. Yeah, the number one documentary too. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was pretty wild actually. How I, I knew it was taken. This is before, so a lot of people are going. You know the the Streisand effect helped you, and blah blah blah. And I it did, but not really. So when hoax was selling on Amazon, friends of mine were like, "Holy shit! I'm on Amazon, and your film is being told for everybody to watch." So we had like wow. cracked Amazon's algorithm so much that it was either the number one or the number two most recommended film for people to watch. And because so what, it got what happened? Can you tell people about the Amazon ban? Because maybe not everyone knows. Yeah, sure. So that. we so hoaxed, we we signed with a you know real distributor because I don't, you know, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And going in, I go, hey, just so you know, uh, you know, you might have some problems. And they go, oh. No way. This is the story of my life. Whenever I work with people, I was like, just so you know, X, Y, and Z is going to happen. No, this never happens. We're filmmakers. We have all these other controversial films. And I was like, okay, okay, fine. Sure thing. Sure. So I monitor analytics. Like, a, you know, I, the only reason I'm good at the internet is I have really bad ADHD. So I monitor <laughs> things by like the second. And I was like, well, that's interesting. Hoax isn't showing up in search results. Hmm. So then I, you know, po posted a link on Twitter. People are like, yeah, it's not showing up on search. And then I go, they're going to ban it. Sure enough, it just vanished. So my distributor talked to Amazon and they were like, dude, what are you doing? Amazon told them, well, all we're going to tell you is that it's not a technical error. We're not going to put it back on and we're not going to tell you anything else. <laughs> Whoa, so they've basically admitted it. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they, they admitted it fully, yeah. And didn't they say they don't have to give you a reason? Yeah, they said we, we don't have to give you any other reason beyond it's not a te uh, technical issue. So remind me again, uh, what was the name of the guy that was in Hoax that runs Amazon? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we, so we actually think because there's just a little itty bit in there talking about how Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post and then the Washington Post runs propaganda for Bezos and Amazon and Amazon also has a six, $600 million contract with the CIA. So, you know, one of the little vignettes, I guess, of hoaxed is how uh, these prestigious legacy publications are no different than the private blog of a billionaire. And it's a good investment. Bezos puts $500 million in there. He's worth a you know, hundred and some billion. It's nothing to him. Yep. And he gets protection, just like, I, I'm not sure if this was a hoax or not, but I talked about it before. Carlos Slim had done the same thing with the New York Times years ago. He saved them during the you know recession. He's not a good person, <laughs> to put it mildly. Right. Um, it, it, he would be, he's everything that they call Sheldon Adelson. And the New York Times just, okay, okay, you're good. So that's our point is these, these big prestigious outlets are the private hobby blogs of billionaires i correct me if i'm wrong but i think after carlos slim invested in the times they changed their stance on immigration yes. quite significantly right 
Yeah, the New York Times, it's wild, actually. It's a great point you bring that up. If you go read, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because if you read old- <laughs> It's New so York, ridiculous. You have to laugh at yeah, it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you go read old articles from the New York Times, it was very hawkish about immigration. Like, well, you know, immigration is- you know, bad for labor, it's bad for unions, you're driving down wages. It was a big issue. And the left used to be hawkish on immigration. And then, so the New York Times, you read their old columns and it's unrecognizable. And that shift in coverage did change from Carlos Slim. Now, the, you know, we don't want to just play false, false correlation. Why did it change? Well, Carlos Slim makes all of his money. He had, at least I don't know what he does now, but he had a monopoly on cell phones. So every person who goes across the border and then calls Mexico, he gets a cut of that. So it's in his interest to get as many customers um, making these international calls as possible. Right. Right. Mike, I, I want to, is ahead, it Carrie. okay if I, if I back up just a little bit and um, cause I know there are some people watching who um, are not familiar with you and we have a, um, I, I don't know if you know my background, but I come from the left. I used to be what I most often call an SJW. And I believed a lot of things about you that I turned out to be false. <laughs> and when I started following you and watching your documentaries and I read um, Red Girl and Mindset, and, but I still, when I post stuff from you, I still come across people on the left who they know, um, they know just what they've been told about you. So they'll say like, oh, the Pizzagate guy or you know, what you addressed in hoax. Um, could you, when I started watching you, I was like, I don't, well, he's not radical right wing, but I don't even think he's right wing. I don't even know how to characterize you. Would you, do you have, do you, t do you identify as being on the right or left or what are your political leanings or, cause some of yeah. the stuff I'm, go ahead. Yeah. One thing um, to be direct and then indirect is the, the indirect answer is that if you're a, a person, you're like a kaleidoscope and people sort of tilt it a certain way. And then that's who you are. And that's the totality of who you are. There's a, a line, I think, from Buddhist thought, which is you pick up a handful of sand and you call that all of the universe. And there's a common human thought process. So people go, oh, Cernovich is this or Cernovich is that. In a way, I'm like, I'm 42 and I always feel weird saying this, but I'm always like, what do I even do? You know, like, <laughs> why are people so mad? Like, I, I don't, I don't even get it. I'm like, what do I do? Oh God, you're mad about shitty tweets from 10 years ago. <laughs> I was satirizing something else, you know, but you're not mad about James Gunn's tweets. So you're not mad about, you know, everybody in 2011 on Twitter was a you know, moron. And they're like, well, you know, the pizza gate thing. I was like, Oh, so you, do you mean like how I was talking about Jeffrey Epstein? No, you weren't. Yes, I was. You mean like how I went to court to win a lawsuit to get records of Jeffrey Epstein. No, you weren't. It's on, you know, and that's where, you know, and you talked about that in your, the DM, like criticism versus hate is I've never had somebody say, you know what? I don't like this guy. He's the Pizzagate guy. And then I go, oh, you know, here's the Miami Herald, Julie Brown, you know who she is. Yeah. Well, you can read her articles and she mentions my role in getting these Epstein records. Mm -hmm. Nobody's ever said, holy shit. I had this guy pegged all wrong. You know, maybe I'll reassess my view of him. Maybe there's a little more complicated conversation to be had there. It just never happens. And I've, uh, so the, the hardest thing, and this will happen as your guys' profile grows is just people believe things about you that aren't true. They write things about you that aren't true. And at first it hurts, but then you, you, you see it where they're just, I'll give you an example. There was an article in the New York times or a column, whatever you want to call it where they claim that my wife was Asian. And it's like, well, no, she's Persian. And they, the whole article, the theory of the article was white supremacists are attracted to Southeastern Asian people because of white supremacy. No, I'm not kidding you. This is actual real <laughs> a column that you can find in the New York Times. I'm not joking. There's no, you, no, I'm no exaggeration. And then if you read it, they're like, oh yeah, then Mike Cernovich's wife is Asian. And I'm like, you people are just idiots. So first of all, that pretzel logic of, you know, if you're, if you're in an interracial marriage, that's really more proof that you're racist than if you weren't, but they can't even, at the New York times, they can't even figure out that my wife is a Farsi speaker. My daughter's name is Syrah. The other one's Rumi. Rumi's a Persian poet. You don't have to be the most 
cultured person in the world to be like, oh, Cyrus and Rumi, I wonder if that's after like Cyrus the Great or Rumi, I wonder if that's like the poet. And these are supposed to be like learned, literate people. And then even with the Epstein stuff, I had people try to say that I was filing the suit to help Epstein. And I'm so at some point, your brain will break. It'll just scramble if you don't become comfortable with just <sighs> people are going to believe things about me yeah. that are dishonest. And some people mean well, most people don't. And then the flip side to that is it's just, I'm very conscientious of like, if you find me today and you read me for a year, whatever you believe is going to change, but yeah. you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to spend a little bit of time. Cause you're like, Oh, it's been a year. He hasn't said anything crazy. I tweet hundreds of times a day too. It's like, there's no, like reporters that would get bored with me because they'd be with me. You know, we're cracking open bottles of wine. You know, they're thinking that I'm going to, the real me is going to come out and they're going to get these like recordings of me. Hundreds of hours I spent with reporters. And I'm like, no, no, there's no, like, there's no real hidden agenda here. So the left, yeah, they, they do have a caricature of you, but MAGA people have a caricature of me. Every, everybody does. And it's just the nature of being any kind of public person. Well, that's you one of the to things having... I like. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, one of the things I like <laughs> about you is that you, um, like you said, the MAGA people have a, a caricature of you as well. And you, you don't seem to be, I appreciate people who aren't beholden to ideology over for lack of a better word like searching for truth or trying to figure out what they really think about things and you piss people off equally on both so-called sides if you're if you're a person who believes in right and left is important then if they actually start following your feed it's like oh now all the MAGA people are mad at him because he doesn't support what's happening in Syria or you know it's it's you you are an equal opportunity offender <laughs> it's because you're just trying to figure out what you think um, I had one other one other question about this though, since you mentioned the about people like sending hate your way and stuff. I was just I was wanting to ask your advice on because you also I, I noticed you'll you'll interact with people sometimes. Some of uh, your biggest critics you'll you'll retweet them and you'll retweet people who um, maybe prove that you're wrong about something or have have a study that says the opposite. And how do you discern? I'm at a place where I'm trying to be able to discern between the um, the criticism that's in good faith and the criticism that's in bad faith. So who's, cause then there's the other people you dunk on, which is hilarious. <laughs> and I don't usually name call, but when, oh, when I see you do it, I'm like, how did he do that? That was the perfect person to do that to. So how do you make that distinction between criticism? Yeah, the, um, so I found that most criticism is done privately. People like you, for example, you'd be like, hey, so people said this like thing about you, you know, is this like a true thing? And that usually comes from a good place, a, a place where you're just trying to understand it. But if you're tweeting out, oh, yeah, did you know Cernovich is the, the worst person in the world because of X, Y, Z, you're, you're not actually trying to, because my DMs are open, you're not actually trying to figure anything out. You're just trying to, to use me to get views, dunk on me to get views. And because of that, I just, you know, I act accordingly. So like one thing I do is there. Um, so the reason my insults are so good is because if you go to a basic human level, because it's usually men attacking, it's never women, it's usually, usually men. And there's a, every man is insecure about one of three things, right? His job, you know, how much money he has, you know, how does he look? or the attractiveness of his wife or the women that he dates, right? So what I do is I'm just like, hmm, I wonder what this guy's insecure about. It's gotta be one of those three. <laughs> and, then, and then, so you just zoom into that like one of three category, I bet it's this. Okay, here's, here's where I'm going to, here's where I'm gonna go in. So it's, it's that basic human nature where you're finding or one person put it, um, Andrew Morantz wrote a lengthy book about me. And before he decided to, portray me in a different light to to get the podcast views that he went on a huge podcast speaking tour on my name to the ted talk because of me he was like you know i think i figured out what you do and i go what he said well you know you always told me to read how to win friends and influence people and how great the book is and i said yeah andrew yeah he said so when you're going after people you just do the opposite of what the book says to do right <laughs> <laughs> 
And then, cause you realize when you read, you know, cause I'm from a mindset background before this, you realize like people want to feel significant. People want to feel like they want, they matter this. That's why even when people are lashing out at you, that's like a human desire to be seen. That's a human desire to be a, a consequential person. And everybody, myself included has, has that kind of desire. And when you want to win friends and influence people, you just figure, well, how can I help make that guy feel significant? Or how can I make that girl feel significant? Like, what can I do? that's going to be in a way their love language right and the yep. so then the converse of that is like oh okay this is this guy wants you know he wants to go like this he wants to come at me like this i'll i know how to go after him too and that so then you find ways to make people feel insignificant <laughs> that great some people can you talk a little bit about um what your role is because i know like how you view your role in society because i know you know, in hoax and Scott Adams has talked about this extensively, the, the two movies, uh, you know, outlook on life. And as Carrie mentioned, each camp tries to label you one thing or another. Um, but you've talked about being like a funhouse mirror. And I think that's not a role that people are used to even existing in the world. So when I first heard you say that it was in hoax and I had already been following you and Pay attention to what you're doing, but I would never have thought to characterize what you're doing as a funhouse mirror um, until you said it. And it was like a new category of a person that I hadn't thought about before. Can you talk about what you mean by that and uh, how you fill that role? Yeah, sure. So the the that bit in hoaxed was um, the funhouse mirror. And here, here's kind of what I mean by that: is people people say, "Oh my God, Cernovich." such a bad person and here's why. And they, they throw themselves into like a, a fit, right? Like, oh, they fainting to the couch or whatever. So what I do is, cause they, they really have tried to ruin my life over, over things that, you know, I should have not said or maybe not joked about. And you're like, yeah, that was kind of an insensitive thing to joke about and I'm not a professional comedian. So like, to me, that's fair criticism. It's like, are you a comedian? No. Well, then you probably shouldn't go near certain subjects. Fair enough. And but then I started finding, I was like, wait, they all have these tweets too. You know, <laughs> everybody who was on Twitter that era has tweets worse than mine or, you know, in the same league. So then I was like, fine, you know, there. So what happened to me is I went on Fox News and I like did so well that there literally was an immediate pushback by the left to get me off Fox News. So I was like, they found things that I don't even think I wrote. I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to find your stuff. And I'm going to find your tweets. Okay, you oh, you tweeted about uh, pedophilia? Well, you clearly are not joking because I'm not joking. Because if I say anything, then I mean it sincerely. Okay. Then that's what I'm – and then people are like, how dare you? This is weaponized outrage and bad faith. And you're like, wait a minute. How is it bad faith if I do the same thing that you're doing? Well, I mean, it's different. Why is it different? They can never explain that, right? Well, it was just a joke when he said it. Well, how do you know? The James Gunn thing, I think, was like the because first of all, I don't think most of that stuff was a joke. Ha ha ha. Mm, further research has revealed that I think that he may have been harmed as a kid, so that's why I lay off of him now because I think he was just probably processing a lot of things, bad emotions, and, and probably wasn't acting out of them. So that, for me, that's a little, little, little bit of a delicate issue. But whatever he said, that was bad. That's as bad as you can go. And the media is all defending him <laughs> because I found them. Yeah. Bad faith actor, Mike Cernovich weaponizes outrage. Finds these. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like this is literally what you guys did to me. And when I find other people's tweets and I report on them, like I found a Buzzfeed reporter's tweets, pretty bad stuff. Um, so I write about it and they're like, how dare you? And I'm like, well, you've written about my tweets, right? So either tweets matter or they don't. And that's why I make them so angry is because the traditional conservative thing is, oh my God, I'm being bullied. They're so mean to me, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm just going to shine a mirror on you. So if we're allowed to write about tweets, then, and you're going to write about mine and, and try to use a few jokes to, you know, get me banned from TV or whatever, that's fine. Then I'm not going to go cry myself to sleep in the corner. I'm going to go find yours. And it grates on them. And that's yeah. where the, the mirror is because I'm shining a mirror on them. I'm doing much, nothing any differently than what they do. 
how much self-awareness do you think the corporate media actually has? Because, you know, when I, when I see them blame you for Pizzagate, for example, or the shooting related to Pizzagate, right? And they present you as this guy who's extremely dangerous because he talks about something that might be a conspiracy theory and may or may not be true and, and you know, goes too close to the edge there. And that's very dangerous and people could die. When they make that case, I think normal people see the media say that and think, isn't that what you guys do all the time? If this small guy over here is that dangerous, how much more dangerous must be the corporate media doing all of this all the time? Um, do they have any self-awareness, do you think, at, at all? No, I mean, having talked with hundreds, hundreds of hundreds of reporters, they, you know, because to talk about the two movies that Scott Adams mentions as in hoax, they're, they really are watching their movie. Very few people can go back and forth between movies and say, oh, okay, here's the Trump movie. Trump, oh yeah, Trump is great. MAGA, oh, he's dunking on this guy. And then the other movie on the left, oh my God, he's the most terrible person in the world. And then when you kind of flip through both movies, you're just like, God, this was kind of a dumb thing he did today, but he's not actually waging war on the press. This is really dumb. Most people can't, I would say maybe 90% can't even do that. And that includes most supporters. They're, they're like a couple who are like, oh yeah, we know that was like that thing we did on you. We knew that was bullshit, you know, but we just did it because it would have got views and we don't like you and font, whatever. At least but, that's honest, I guess. Yeah. Cause I've talked to them sincerely. I was like, explain to me how, cause I've said this before. I was like, look, how is me writing about James Gunn's tweets any different than when you write about mine? Well, he was joking. How do you know? Have you interviewed him? No, I've tried to. They want to answer my interviews. I'm like, but I'll answer them. He's hiding from you. So if you were a logical person, you would be like, well, maybe Cernovich is a liar or whatever. But you would be like, well, James Gunn has do dodged interviews. So what, you know, what is he hiding? He deleted his whole blog. You know, like that, that whole cover up, like if you were there, you just saw it in real time, like mm -hmm. things just vanish. Nobody's like, oh yeah, what about this um, blog post? That was, in my opinion, worse than some of the tweets. So no, they don't. They don't have that kind of awareness. I think one of the the yeah. most revealing parts of, about that and, and about you know your role as what you said like a funhouse mirror was in hoax when you showed the excerpt from sixty minutes, mm -hmm. and they asked you about um, uh, you know having a doctor who hadn't actually um, diagnosed or hadn't actually been in a room with Hillary Clinton saying that she had she was ill, and. And, but that's what they do to Trump all the time. And, it, and it's almost like you like Carter saying that I was, I was blown away by the lack of self-awareness because you asked him, he said, no, she had pneumonia. And you're like, how do you know that? Because that's what the campaign told us. Right. Why do you believe the campaign? <laughs> that was like, that, that was very revealing about the lack of self-awareness, I think. Do you think in that moment he realized? No, he didn't because that's how that's how deeply embroidered or deeply embedded in the system they are. And in fairness, like I, like I deal this with Trump supporters too, all the time. One time I tweet, I lost 11,000 followers at this tweet. Uh, this was a year and a half ago, maybe. I was like, aren't you people just tired of making excuses for Trump? <laughs> you know, ratio, ratio, but it's true. Oh, Trump, the swamp, he can't hire people that like him because of the swamp, this, it's just like, he's 72 years old. He's a billionaire. You know, my kid is three and a half. When my kid acts out, I'm like, well, it's my kid. What are you going to do? You got to, you know, figure out a pathway. So when I said, aren't you tired of making excuses for Trump? You'd think the answer would be, well, yeah, actually, kind of, we are. We want to get outcomes. No, no, no. The answer is, you don't know what he's going through. You're a fake patriot. You're a grifter. You're this. So that lack of self awareness that the media has. Uh, is the same that just anybody who's partisan has. So there's I nothing see special. Yeah. D d I mean, one of the other things that really struck me about that clip, even in Hoaxed, was the laziness that it, <laughs> the mainstream media just seems to embody in a way that I don't think regular people understand just how lazy reporters are. Um, there's just literally no, I mean, Pizzagate was an example. There's been zero follow-up for any of the stuff that's kind of hokey in those WikiLeaks emails, nothing. Um, and when you confronted him about like, well, why would you believe the Hillary campaign? Um, it, is reporting that lazy and has it always been, I mean, I know in your, in your 
in your documentary, you've got um, you've got an expert talking about the past and and how the the history of me. I think it's Jim Kuipers. Um, but in the last five to seven years, it seems to have gotten a lot worse, and he doesn't really talk about that too much. Has media always been this lazy, or like what happened? I'm. That's a good question. So I probably. Even though we put him in there and he he offered that perspective, I think it's probably always been this bad. And and here's sort of why. I'm the reason I'm look really great at what I do is because I stay in my lane. And I don't I don't venture out. So even with the coronavirus stuff, I'm not going into like deep mathematical modeling or something like that. But there, you'll be a reporter and or at least you'll see on Twitter, somebody will be like, oh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are having this problem. And now they have an opinion five minutes later, and then I'll, I'll back search their old tweets, right? I'm like, you've never mentioned Qatar in your entire life. There's no evidence you've ever been to the Middle East. There's no evidence you've read a book about the Middle East. But you now know about the very intricate, delicate, tribalistic relationships in the 15 different forms of Islam permeating through two different oil-rich Gulf nation states. Get out of here, right? So they'll just hot take, oh, yeah, the Saudis are the bad or the Qataris are bad or Qatar has a, Air Force, a military base, therefore they're good. And you can't, be, you can't know everything. But they feel like they, they are, they never, it's like they never graduate undergrad there. You're an undergrad. And you, like when I was an undergrad, I had opinion on everything, right? Oh, yeah, free will. Why? Well, because I feel like I have, da, da, da. now people are like, well, it's free will. And I'm like, yeah, I think it is. If they want to argue with me, I was like, I'm not going to argue with you. I've read the books. I've read Danette. I've read, I've, I've, I've read all the stuff. Okay. You know, cool. I don't, so I don't feel like if somebody's like, well, I don't think free will, free will exist, debate me. I'm like, I, no, no, not, not, <laughs> not. And, and I'm that way about like a lot of issues is whatever the hot issue of the day is, I don't feel like I have to jump in and have an opinion. Or if I do, I try to have an informed opinion. So a lot of it is, not even bad. Like take, for example, Saudis versus Qataris. This broke down like, I don't know, five years ago, three years ago, whatever. The, the right take is probably, you know, I don't think either of them are the good guys or the bad guys. It's complicated. What are they really beefing about? Same thing with the war in Yemen. Oh, the Saudis are killing uh, the you know refugees. And like, well, yeah, but the Iranians are using them to fire rockets at the Saudis too. And there's, a, there's like a proxy terror war there. And it's a pretty complicated situation. So the right answer is it's a pretty complicated situation, but you can't say that. You have to be like the Saudis are slaughtering rebels, or if you're MAGA, you have to be the Iranians are at it again. You just can't trust them. We need regime change in Syria and Iran because of this. And if you're just kind of in the middle, you're, you're looking at these people like you're all just absurd. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that up because I, I don't I don't know much about the Middle East, but the other day I, I ended up reading, I couldn't sleep and I read about the Iranian revolution or the coup in 1953. Um, and I had only known really about the revolution in the 70s, in the late 70s, uh, in 79. And again, it was this kind of like, oh yes, this is a very clear picture of Iran. And then I read about what happened, you know, a few decades before. And it's like, oh, it's actually, it's not so clear anymore, really, who the bad guys and good guys are. And the US and the UK aren't completely innocent. Uh, and, and everything seems to be much more complicated. And the thing that's um, I'm thinking about now is actually the coronavirus is a great example of this. You've got t two, like two sides of the coronavirus narrative that seem to be the whole thing is a, a made up hoax kind of, it's like the flu or it's it's an apocalypse and or and Trump has done everything right or everything wrong. And you know, it's one of these complicated things where the, the truth is the nuance in between all of that likely. Is there something right, and, that woke you up as a, like, as you were talking about when you were young, when you're in college and you know, you had opinions on everything. And, and I definitely, I way beyond college, I was, an SJW for 20 years. So I had opinions that were not my own for a very long time. Um, and for me, there were there were a series of things that started to wake me up. Uh, one was seeing some of the footage of Trump supporters being attacked on YouTube, which I had never seen before. And some of that was in your film. Um, was there something that, and, I don't know, and maybe you were never an ideologue, you just had strong opinions that you hadn't thought about for a while, but was there, were there something that kind of opened your mind to the fact that um, 
the mainstream news is not telling me the truth necessarily? Or were you always, did you always question the main narrative? Well, I was right leaning probably when I was younger, I would come much less, less so. And there were things that you would see. So for example, Al Gore's kid got arrested for marijuana. And unless you knew about the website, the smoking gun, where they had the, you know, the mug shots and everything like that, you just never would have known that. And I was like, well, Jenna Bush buys a beer at UT Austin when she's 19. And that's on the front page of every newspaper. But then Al Gore's kid gets arrested for marijuana, but he doesn't get a fine and the story gets killed. You're, you're just like, okay, this is how, this is how the game works. I never trusted much of that. And especially cause I've always been pro gun and I still am. You, when you read them write about guns and this is actually resurfacing now in a funny way. Well, um, a lot of liberals are like going to gun stores and they're frustrated because they, they really believe you can walk out with the gun, you know, give them your credit card. And they're like, I want my gun. I was like, well, no, you can't, you can't have it. I mean, there's like, there's waiting periods and it's your first purchase and everything else. So I just known that on issues that I, that I understood the media was pretty bad. Yeah. What, this, um, the other thing that that's come out recently is this Russian collusion narrative, which I know, um, you've talked about in the past, but, uh, I'm wondering if what it's making me wonder if most of what the mainstream media engages in is just projection, because if you see that the declassified footnotes from the IG report now, it turns out, I'll, I'll, let me quote Senator Chuck Grassley and Ron Johnson, quote, these footnotes confirm that there was a direct disinformation campaign in 2016, and there were ties between Russian intelligence and a presidential campaign, the Clinton campaign, not Trump's. I, it seems like time and time again, almost everything they do is projection. Do you experience that as well or no? There's no, they really do again. Cause I've met more than, I mean, I I've done, I could write a book on reporters that I met because I've spent so much time with these people. Like, so for example, this New Yorker guy to, you know, he wrote this book, big book and he went to my hometown with me, everything. So that's the level of intimacy I have with everybody from every outlet, from the Atlantic, the New Yorker to the, like the gutter gawker kind of blogs they really do like they're true believers they are they are zealots in every sense of the word trying to reason with them is a lot like if um you know a jehovah's witness knocks on your door and i'm like well you know i respect your point of view and or like my parents who are like very evangelical like they believe i'm going to hell you know they just we love you we hope you find god if you don't you, you know you're, and there's no way that i can tell them well maybe there's something else to this and it's the same way. So they are with them. They have their religion and their religion is democratic orthodoxy. Well, one of the, one of the claims though, I've seen is like, I, I guess James O'Keefe kind of makes this, he implies that it's just because they're about money and that's, and not about the truth. Do you think it's just that they're about money? Cause it seems to me that they're not just about money. There's other ways. No, to they're not money. making any money. No, they're broke. No, no, they're not. No, no, they're not making any money They're So I think, they're just, they're, it's just ideal, it's ideologues. And they all grew up, would we number, word, word and Bernstein. So they want to take it down a president. And then that just trickles down to, well, I can't make a president resign, but maybe I can destroy Mike Cernovich's life. Not thinking like I got two daughters, like I got a wife, you know, maybe, which works both ways is if you're a sympathetic person or a decent person, you'd be like, well, maybe this is kind of a shitty thing to try to do. Or if you even have a little bit of like common sense, you're just like, well, y y how would I respond if, if somebody were trying to target the livelihood of my kids, you know, maybe this isn't a very smart thing to do. And there's just none of that because they, it is pure zealotry. It is pure you know, ideology. Is there anyone I mean, doing a good job of reporting? Like any reporters that you said you've met thousands and like, who's good. Yeah, that's, um, in terms of who's good, there aren't many. There are people that'll have a kind of a good day, and that's that's it. There, there, <laughs> there's no person who, if I read that this person, I believe it. I'm like, well, I better, I better look behind this. I better look behind that. But there are people that I think were fair. Like, so for example, Marantz's uh, articles were fair. His book was fair. And then he went, he, he was a good writer. And then he goes in these talks. And so I'll give you an example. The book's like pretty straightforward, pretty clean about my life. 
Then he goes on a podcast with Sam Harris and says, well, yeah, I found Cernovich's divorce records and he didn't want me to find these. I had to really dig. And it's like, I showed you them myself, right? Like you didn't have to <laughs> dig for these. The only reason people know that I made money in a divorce is I've talked about it. There, there's no like sleuthing that you had to do. And so that was a little, little disappointing because he was somebody who I thought was, you know, pretty far left in terms of his views, but you could generally speaking, rely on what he was writing. You're like, well, that's true. It might be slanted. You're putting together facts of a person into a puzzle and that the mosaic is going to look for everything because even my own people, I've linked to things about me that I thought were pretty fair. And like, if you like me, you're like, I can't believe they wrote that thing about you. It's like, what are you talking about? Like they, you know, they said that I've made some mistakes and I have. So if people love you. They, they get mad too. And the ultimately everybody in media, they have to pander to their base. And the left, if they write, I had a reporter tell me, he said, if I write anything about you that's nice, I get emails, like hate mail. You're legitimizing him or whatever, even if it's true, right? That's why I was written out of all those Epstein stories is because if you tell the truth about me, then you're going to just get a ton of hate mail. So, you know, why, why write about him? But by playing to that audience and your audience takes control of you. I, I you mm -hmm. actually <clears throat> tweeted something like that about Michael Moore recently you said his audience is controlling him now. And and I, I used to be a huge Michael Moore fan. And I, I would say anyone looking at him objectively now would say that's true um, when you start to try and please the audience rather than just doing your work and trying to you know find the truth in your work, um, your catering. And and that that also makes me think of something else you were talking about. And I, I wanted to ask you about the, um, Chris Cuomo had his, kind of rant and meltdown recently and you shared it and you were like he's right there's this golden cage that people in the public eye get put into and some of us some people have more a, a greater degree of freedom than others like you were you were saying that you have a lot more freedom than he does because you're independent um but can you talk a little bit about what that cage is and how it's different for different people because he was sort of for anybody that didn't watch it he was ranting that because he's in the public eye if if a man comes up and approaches his family and starts insulting him, he's not allowed to just, you know, tell him off the way that an average citizen would be able to. Yeah, what kind so of restrictions do you feel like are around you? Right. Way. So yeah, Cuomo's what they call the rant. I thought he was just speaking from the heart was like, if you have a show you do every day, you have to talk about whatever the news of the day is. And that's his cage is just mostly bullshit. Trump yelled at Brian Karam, because Brian Karam was, and you're like, this is fucking dumb. This is just a dumb thing. This is why am I spending my time thinking about this? But you have to talk about it. And then moreover, you have to choose a side if you're on CNN. Trump is attacking the free press yet again. Can you believe how he's persecuting all these poor journalists? And should we even air these press? That's what your life is, bro. And there, there's a me, I've had shitty jobs. So as far as shitty jobs go, that's not even a top 10. But, you know, even if you have a shitty job, you're like, you know, I, I did Tesla core and I was like, man, this sucks. Uh, it, it isn't like if you're having to, to play into this hyper partisanship, you don't think, yeah, this job sucks, all things considered. And he was speaking that. And I, and I feel that way a lot too, which is less so because I've alienated so many people over the years, but like, I was pissed off about that uh, bailout of Boeing 96, zero, you know, every, every Senator was there voted for it. So I was just like, fuck it. I'm going to help Democrats win. And people, you know, if you know me, you're like, Oh God, you know, there's Mike ranting again, but I lost, you know, 10,000 people. And I was like, good riddance. You were all fucking dumb anyway. Right. You really think I'm going to door knock for Diane Feinstein. I don't even door knock for Mitch McConnell. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, wait, I'm glad you brought this up because I know you don't have a lot more time left and I wanted to talk about the 2020 election coming up. Uh, what's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know that Joe Biden survives. Um, that's why I've been deliberately um, cagey when I'm responding to that because there's, I don't think Joe, I, Joe Biden, there's a non-zero chance that he doesn't make it. He's clearly not a healthy guy. But, but Wisconsin was very bad for Trump. People can say, well, Trump was running unopposed in the primary and da, da, da. like, I know all the, the counter arguments. I think Trump has lost Wisconsin. 
the coronavirus is bad on boomers. That's his voting base. So he's going to lose a few thousand people just through coronavirus, whatever it is, even if it's not as dangerous as, as you know, we've been told. He's still going to lose. A, he's just going to lose a net number of voters there for sure. I don't think he's gained voters. You know, everybody wants to say, well, all these other people who liked him don't like him. A few but we're talking a few people who are kind of like never Trumpers anyway. So what happens is you're like, oh yeah, this guy hated Trump, Eric Erickson, but now he's pro Trump. And I was like, well, yeah, but I was around in 15 and 16 and Eric Erickson went all in to stop Trump and couldn't. So how much clout does he really carry? Same thing with Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck was, did this infamous skit where he put uh, cracked Cheetos in a bowl and put it on his face and said, I'm the Cheeto man, Donald Trump. And all Glenn did was lost his audience. So it doesn't like, oh, Glenn Beck is pro-Trump now. whoop do you do What is that, 100 votes maybe that, that he could flip? National Review, Dana Loesch, they were all anti-Trump. So I, I think it's bad. I think it's a bad map for Trump. But the flip side is Democrats have chosen to run a very feeble and unfit Joe Biden. That's, that's, my, that's my way of saying, uh, I don't know. But if Joe Biden physically survives three, three debates, and physically makes it to the poll, I think it's a good chance that Trump loses. Wow. What about what about the walkaway movement? You hear a lot of people say like, oh, I used to be a Democrat or I mean, Carrie's actually in this camp, right? She was a social justice warrior. And now I don't know, are you going to vote for Trump, Carrie? Well, see, know. so I finally decided a month or so ago, I'm going to vote for him unless there's some unknown third party person who enters who I really like. And then because I believe in voting my conscience, I would choose that person, but I can't imagine who that would be. So I'm probably going to vote for Trump. And I, I'm a person who cried the night he was elected and was calling him a demagogue. And so my perception is probably skewed because I've since met a lot of other walkaway people. And so I know a lot of people who didn't vote for him, who hated him and have really swung towards, um, I, some of them even became Republicans. Um, yeah, it's a good question. What do you think of that movement? Do you think there are, it's a lot of people or... I think it feels like a lot because it's prominent people who are in the media. That was why, you know, like take the never Trump phenomenon, for example, a lot of people thought the never Trump phenomenon was millions of people. And that is in a way um, segues into hoax is you think that because CNN has a panel, I'm a lifelong Republican. Now I hate Trump national review. We all hate Trump, the blaze. We hate Trump. Washington Post, conservative columnists, we hate Trump. So if you're reading the media, you're like, oh, wow, there must be like millions of people who just aren't going to vote for Trump. This is a really big movement. Then you find out maybe it's like 300,000. I mean, remember that guy, Joe Walsh, tried to run against Trump in Iowa, and yep. he was laughed in the room. So I think that the bias on right now with the walkaway people is, you know, you have a lot of charming, charismatic people. There's a lot of promotion of the walkaway movement from the Trump campaign, turning points, promoting it. There's a lot of, cause you want to get these people front facing, right? And say, look, there's all these people. So if you're in that media world, you're like, yeah, they're, yeah I'm going to generalize that into like millions of voters. So, but then you, but then you watch the, for, for example, the Democrat election results, who saw Joe Biden was going to be the nominee, right? Scott Adams yeah. thought it was Kamala Harris. Uh, I thought it would be, probably be more if I, I didn't choose, but if you'd have made me bet, I would have bet it'd be Elizabeth Warren. Um, I just I felt like we're in time for like a, a calm, sober woman who's good on economic issues. You know, I didn't think the Pocahontas stuff would stick that much. And it's Joe Biden. So, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're all sort of our, our biases are always going to be what they be. Yeah, so I thought it would have been when, when people go, who's going to win the Democrat primary? I go, well, the media wants Kamala Harris, but I think it's going to be Warren. No, it's Joe Biden. He destroys Bloomberg, who spent a billion dollars. He beat Bernie. He just crushes everyone. So I'm, I'm thinking here, okay, whatever I'm watching, whatever tea leaves, you know, I'm tossing on the table to kind of read, I need to find better tea leaves. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Hey, before you go, um, I want to ask, so you've done, I, I'm really impressed with the way that you've just kind of decide you're going to do something new and then you go do it. You know, you've been, we talked about, you were mostly in mindset world. You did the book, Guerrilla Mindset. And then you got into independent journalism and then you did this um, documentary film hoax, which is one of the best films I've seen in, in the past few years. Um, what, what, uh, is there anything you haven't done yet that you're interested in doing? Oh yes. I want to, <laughs> yeah, th that's a great question. So I want to do 
a very deep novel. I don't think I'm ready for one of those yet. So to pay the bills, I got to get another mindset book out, Audacity, How to Go from Nobody to Somebody, which is essentially a guidebook on, you know, how you can do everything. And I didn't feel that, that I could authentically release that book until I'd done it all. And I'm like, okay, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that there aren't a lot of people who have done what I've done. And then once I have that out, yeah, I've, my last kind of work is I want to do like a really rich spiritual legacy novel. I don't know that I'll hit alchemist levels, but something along that line, just a really soulful piece of work that people will read and would never have imagined that I could have written that. That's eight yeah. years away though. I'm 42. So I don't think <laughs> I'll be, you know, I don't think I, I've lived quite enough yet. I think right when I'm about 48, 49, then I'll sit down and do that one. Well, then this, this rolls into the last question and then we can let you go. But the last question is, um, and I, you know, how has becoming a father changed you? It's more of a personal question, but I, you know, I know you were, you were kind of this young, fast and loose guy when you rose to, to prominence. You're a dad now. Uh, how's that changed? Yeah. The, the number one thing is, um, to, so there's private and public and privately, I just do a lot of dumb shit, you know? I was uh, very, whatever the opposite of risk averse is, I was. You want to jump off this cliff into the water? Sure. I'm, you know, how many feet is it? I don't know. Like one time I landed and I felt as it was like, I felt the surface area friction of the water where it didn't give way for a second because I was too far down. I was like, oh man, I think I'm about to break my foot. Fortunately, I hadn't. So I was the guy who would do that. Like, I'll just take any kind of risk. I don't really care. I'll be fine no matter what happens. So privately, I don't, I don't do much risky activity. I don't do, you know, much YOLO kind of stuff, which I used to do before. And then publicly, it's made me like more empathetic. So when people like lose their jobs before, I might be like, well, you know, I didn't really understand you have kids, right? It's like a different thing. So right. my core demos, men say 25 to 44, most of them don't have kids. And if some guy's like, well, I lost my job, I was like, I don't care. Go to the gym or something, bro. Go cry yourself to sleep. You know, what's your problem? And sometimes that, and that's the right answer. If you're a young single guy with no kids, that's yep. the, there is the right answer, which is go. You're fine, dude. I don't know. I don't know in your own mind why you think the world is ending. What, what are you going to do? Go sleep on someone's couch. It, it, right. We've all been there. Right. But, but when you look at people, you have kids, you're like, Oh my God, you know, this is like devastating for people. So it's made me, Certainly policy-wise, more, more of an economic populist, I think, than I already was. It makes me a little bit more wound up about, you know, Boeing gets 17 billion or whatever they're getting, and they're all just looting the country. And then just the average guy making 15 bucks an hour, average, you know, single mom making 15, 18 bucks an hour, they're just getting the shaft. And I feel that in an emotional way that I didn't feel before having children. Well, um, yeah, I Great answer. Thank you for sharing that with us, Mike. Um, I know you got to run. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, good luck on your next project. And I know I speak for Carrie also when everyone should watch Hoaxed. When I say this, everyone should watch Hoaxed. It is, uh, I'm not saying that just because Mike's here. We've said this in the past. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a great documentary. It's an eye-opening, red-pilling documentary that uh, should be widely distributed. Probably should be in every high school. So um, thanks again, Mike. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank Have you so guy. much. Yeah. Bye, Carter. Um, bye. <laughs> <laughs>